we've been looking at the tenth commandment out of the uh, ten. We've been on the tenth commandment. We had a message last week, and uh, I want to look at it again because it's such an important command. And I know we're not in the book of Exodus. We're going through the book of Exodus, but we're actually going to Luke right now. And that's because we looked at the commandment last week, you shall not covet. It mentioned various things we're not to covet, including people's animals and their donkeys and their oxes. And we thought, yeah, you know, what's the problem? I'm really going to covet someone's ox or donkey. But in those days, that would be like wanting to covet someone's Porsche, you know, or their Lexus or whatever, you know, and BMW or whatever you prefer. And... It's still a heart problem today. Covetousness has not gone away. In fact, it's on the rise. In fact, as I mentioned last week, uh, in the last days, the Bible says people would be all into self-love and they would be covetous. And in fact, the very first malady that results from being so self-focused and loving self more than God and others and putting self first is, is you become God on the throne, your own God, and, and you tend to want what you know is in the heart and your desires and you don't really... Uh, you know, you succumb to temptations and you don't really pay attention to boundaries and what's right. And we have a nation that is bred on materialism, you know, the Madison Avenue mentality. And it's heartbreaking because uh, it destroys a lot of lives. A lot of people get destroyed as a result of covetousness. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 5, it says, Let your lifestyle be without covetousness. And it's a neat verse because if you look at verse 5 and verse 6, he goes on to say things like, you know, uh, know, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And he's trying to call us to contentment because we don't need to be involved in covenant. We can trust the Lord that he's not going to leave us or forsake us. He's ultimately in control, you know. And that's part of the promise there. And I think it's important that we allow that to register is that we have the most as believers, as those who understand that we've been made in God's image, that he loves us, that he's so crazy about us that he sent his son to die for us he's so loved us so we could be saved and and not perish and have eternal life with him i mean what more could you want you know and once you're satisfied in him and and you know him and you have that relationship that that goes a long way toward curing uh the cancer of covetousness and that's huge it's just to know the lord uh ephesians 5 Verse 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. He goes on to say that those who do those things won't inherit the kingdom of Christ. It's very serious sin. Very, very, very serious sin. Now, it's because, you know, and I've mentioned last time we talked about covetousness, that sometimes people when they, you know, they hear, thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not kill or murder or thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are big ones on people's list, but when they come to the 10th commandment, uh, you shall not covet, they tend to think, well, that's, you know, that's not as big a deal. And however, it's probably one of the most practiced sins, definitely in our nation, but it's at the root of many of the other sins, as I mentioned last time. Because the scriptures say, why are there wars among us? Is it not because you have not, you know, and you want and and you lust and you, you take it from someone else? whether it's wars among family members sometimes for an inheritance, family members who've been just, you know, just have loved each other for years, also they turn against each other, or it's wars within, you know, uh, the political arena, or wars between nations. Most wars are started because one nation wants what another nation has. And so there's a lot of bloodshed as a result of coveting. There's a lot of broken families as a result of coveting. Uh, a gambling, that so-called invisible disease. I mean, that's a result of having a covetous heart. People that, it's because of the desire, because the word covet, it means to just want more and more. You know, to thirst and hunger for more and more and never to be satisfied. And it's interesting because a survey I was looking at on compulsive gamblers done at the University of Illinois in Chicago, our researcher Henry uh, Lejeur found that 22% blamed uh, their divorces on their gambling. I mean, that's one out of every five of these people that, you know, they said, hey, you know, I got divorced because of my gambling. That's, that's tragic, man, because there's, there's wives involved, there's husbands, there's, you know, children involved, and probably most of those divorces because of a covetous heart. 40% lost their jobs. 49% stole from their employees, employers to cover debts. And 79% said they wanted to die 
two-thirds of compulsive gamblers committed other crimes to pay for their habits, several studies found. And that's gambling, the new national pastime uh, in Newsday, an article. And I thought, you know, it's heartbreaking because we need to make sure, I mean, right now, I mean, gambling anonymous, you know, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, they have AA and CA and NA. Now they've got the Gambling Anonymous, and it's been doubled just in the last couple of decades, the amount of uh, groups to help people that have just been overcome by covetousness. And what's sad is that our government now sponsors and pushes gambling, you know, in the name of the lottery. And a lot of times it's said, hey, it's going to go toward education. So everybody says, oh, that's cool. And a lot of times it doesn't even get to education. I don't know if you know that. It goes to the general budget, you know. Uh, and a lot of t- sometimes there's more money spent on rehabbing people that are get caught up in gambling than actually is brought in through these lotteries. And it's interesting because uh, if you end up gambling and you just, you know, you throw your money away trying to win more and more money, uh, it not only destroys your family, and it just shows you how serious the sin of covetousness is, it very easily, you know, would destroy your life. I mean, I've got all kinds of statistics. I've done a... a, a uh, a, uh, some research on just people who've won lotteries and followed up their lives. And you would be amazed to see what happens with your average lottery winner. Thinking, man, they're just rich overnight. But what it's done is, is that so-called winning the American dream has introduced them into a nightmare overnight. Because everything changes in their family structure, relatives, wanting money. Uh, and all of a sudden, before you know it, their life is turned upside down and many of them end up bankrupt. You know, uh, some of them end up imprisoned. I mean, you'd be, you'd be amazed. It's, it's crazy. I'll save those statistics for another time. But I will bring up this. First Timothy 5.8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own family, and especially, or for his own, and especially of those of his own household, it says, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if you're professing faith in Christ, yet you're throwing your money away at gambling because you've got this compulsion and you're not focused on saying, hey, I need to just serve God honestly. You know, I need to set my hand to the plow. You know, the Bible says to work with your hands. And that's a blessing. And then you, you have enough, not only for yourself, but to share with others. And if you don't want to go that route and you want to just, you know, not earn your keep by the, uh, the sweat of your brow, and you want to just kind of win it big so you don't have to punch time clock anymore and you think you're going to get the easy way out, man, you had another thing coming. Okay. Uh, and if you end up losing all your money and not able to provide for your family, you can't even buy shoes or clothes for your kids because you just want to be rich. The Bible says you are worse than an unbeliever. That's, it says you're worse than someone that doesn't even know Christ, a pagan out there. And so we need to take this really seriously. And I, and I have to talk about this from time to time now because... I mean, now they've got on ESPN, they've got poker and everything else. And, oh, it seems so fun. But what happens is people get sucked into it. And people tend to have, people tend to esteem themselves very highly. I mean, that's the truth. When you look at statistics, most people, if you ask them if they rate themselves as a driver between 1 and 100, they're not going to say, well, I'm about 34%. They'll usually put themselves in the 80s or 90s. People just have a tendency to, even criminals, who they say suffer from low self-esteem. You know, that must be because they have low self-esteem. Criminals think that they're, you do, do some of these studies in prisons, they've yielded some, incre- they, they have the highest esteem among many people in the nation, you know. That's why they end up in prison a lot of times, because they put themselves above others, committed some crime, you know. And what happens is people, when it comes to gambling, they think they're going to be the one that wins. And typically in the long run, people don't win in gambling. And it's interesting because even it's interesting, the super lottery called Powerball now, that's become pow- uh, real popular just a few years back. It's interesting, I was looking at a study on that, and I was looking at one Powerball that was worth almost you know, $300 million. And there's a book by Larry Loudon uh, called The Book of Risks, and this is what he states in the book. He states that statistically you are far more likely to be killed by an animal, electrocuted, or die by poisoning, or die because of surgery, or be killed falling from your bed, or even freezing to death, than win all or part of, a t- of this 250 to $300 million prize. Now, he's a former philosophy professor at the University of Hawaii, and he gave some of the stats, you know. You have a 3 million to 1 chance of freezing to death, you know. Uh, you have a 2 million to 1 chance of being killed by falling out of bed. I didn't know that one, you know. 
be careful when you get out of bed. But you got a, a lot better chance of get, you know, falling out of bed and dying than winning the lottery if you're playing the lottery. Did you know that? Okay. What happens is, though, they parade the people that win. I mean, the government even has commercials where they'll say they'll show somebody that won and everything. They're just trying to seduce us into the, the, the politicians are thinking, this is how we'll take care of our debt. But what they're doing is they're breeding more and more people that just learn to gamble. And it's really, I believe, personally, my personal conviction is that it's not good for society. That's my personal conviction, you know? And if you're justifying it by saying, hey, you know, I just play the lottery, I throw a lot of money at the lottery because I want to I wanna help the church. I could tell you right now, mark my words, if you win the lottery and you want to give most of it to our fellowship, we will not take it. Because I'm not going to be your excuse for playing the lottery. Okay, do you understand that? Mark my words, Okay. Joe, but what if all of a sudden we throw $3 million? I mean, look how much you could do for the kingdom of God. I feel we'll have compromised our whole foundation, and we won't take it, okay? Because I don't want to be, we don't want to be your excuse, you know? And I'm not, you know, what I'm saying is that, and, and I'm not saying, man, you should feel like, you know, wow, I've, I'm condemned because I played the lottery. What I'm saying is I'm really concerned about tendencies that become a lifestyle that end up destroying families and lives. And there's a lot of people, a lot of professing Christians throughout this nation and throughout the world who started getting involved in gambling and have, are, the, are part of those statistics I read off earlier. And that's because the root of it so often is a covetous heart, you know, wanting more and more and more and not being satisfied with what the Lord has given us or the way or the path in which the Lord has given us to uh, meet our needs and what have you. And we start to forget about what's important in life. And we have to keep in mind, I mean, you know, you can have an extravagant house and you can at the same time have an empty heart. That's the way it is for so many people. You can have all kinds of possessions but have no peace in your life. And I think it's important that we understand that because I, I don't care if you have 10 or 20 or 30, you can have 30 million bucks in the bank and have a thirsty soul still where you're just empty. And that's the way it is for most rich people. I hate to say it. And the Bible doesn't say it's wrong to be rich, but the Bible says it's wrong to live for riches. And somebody who has served the Lord and the Lord has blessed their business and they've, they've, they've been radically blessed, they can have peace in the Lord. But someone who's lived for their business live for money they're not going to have peace because those things were never made to quench the vacuum or to fill the vacuum in our heart because we're created in the image of god amen and that void in our hearts from not knowing god because man has rejected god is only filled by the lord and you've heard the the saying you know it's like trying to you know you know smash a or hammer a a square peg into a circle hole you know and you can't do that and that's what the world tries to do they constantly are filled with covetousness. And Jesus said covetousness comes out of the sinful heart because they're trying to satisfy themselves because they want to run from God and not, not, not follow His guidelines, you know? Not, find, not follow the god you factures handbook. And then they want to have peace, but the Bible says there's no peace to the wicked. It says that three times in the Bible. There's no peace to the wicked. So they don't want to follow the Lord, but they want to have peace. They don't want to follow God of peace. They reject the Prince of Peace. So then they try to f get peace by things. You know, they covet, you know, all the sex they can get or they covet all the money they can get or all the wealth or all the drugs. And guess what? They t over and over again turn up empty. Covetousness means to thirst for more and more and more. And you'll constantly end up empty. You know, it says in the Scriptures in Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 5. We're told in the Scriptures in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loves abundance with increase. Did you catch that? He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of laboring man is sweet. Check that out. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Now, isn't that interesting? One who labors, who works for their money, whether they have a lot to eat or a little, their, sweet, their sleep is still sweet. I, think, I love that passage because they sleep with a good conscience. You know, 
you know, mentally, I mean, they could put their head down on their pillow and know that they've been working. And you know what? Physiologically, the body responds to labor. Less disease, less sickness, less anxiety in the body when you're working. People that don't work and their money comes so easy to them and they, and they do it by, with Ill, and there's ill-gotten gain, they not only physically uh, are restless, but in their hearts they have their conscience to deal with. And if we could understand this and let these truths sink into our heart, it will help us be removed from temptation. You understand what I'm saying? If you see the big picture, that's why I'm a big fan of the big picture. Seeing, you know, looking at things holistically from the scripture, you know, what is the God, what are our origins biblically, you know? You know, where are we at now? What does prophecy say is coming in the future? What's the end for the believer? And if you see the big picture, it'll solve a lot of problems. But if you look at some of the trees within that picture, just in how you sleep at night, because you have a good conscience, and how silver and gold and money doesn't satisfy, that, that'll help you live your life the way you've been called to live. And I just hope and pray that that would register deep in your heart. Because if you can understand that, you'll do quite well. In fact, another translation uh, of that, you know, uses money. If you, you know, love of money will never satisfy. If you're trying to be satisfied with things, you're not going to be satisfied. It's like trying to quench your thirst by eating peanut butter, you know. It's not going to happen, you know. Here, let me make you another peanut butter shake, you know. You're just going to be, okay, wow. I'm thirstier. And that's how it is when you try to satisfy the spiritual longings in the heart and the spiritual component that's needed within the heart that you don't long for if you don't know the Lord, you know, with secular things, worldly things, sensual things, you're going to just get thirstier and thirstier. You're going to be just go batty in the end. Why don't I have any peace? The richest people in the world are the most bitter often, the most depressed. I mean, just let's be honest. Look at Donald Trump. I mean, every time I see that guy interviewed, I mean, he's, I feel sorry for the guy. He's just filled with anger and, and, and bitterness and, you know. I mean, I know he has Rosie O'Donnell to contend with and stuff like that, you know. But he hasn't been crucified on a cross like Jesus, you know. And Jesus said, the joy of the Father's gladness is anointing me. I mean, he is, you know, he went through more than anybody did. And, and he had no place to lay his head, he said. He says the foxes have dens and the nests or the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Yet there was no more content person on earth than the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are far richer than Donald Trump or Bill Gates because if you have a relationship with the living God, you have eternal life. Was it profit a man? Jesus said if he gains the whole world and loses his what? His soul. I pray for those guys. To come to know Jesus, you know, to have eternal life, you know. So it's interesting because you'll never fill that void with, with physical things. And as a believer, if you're not walking in Jesus, you're not walking in the Spirit, you're not walking in the fullness of the Spirit, you're going to succumb to those temptations because you can be deceived. Jesus said, see to that none of you are uh, deceived by the deceitfulness of riches. And Jesus talked about how uh, riches and Things of this world, material things can choke out God's word in your life. So a professing believer can really get choked out. And a lot of problems, I mean, people, it's amazing. I read some time ago about Henrietta Garrett. And that's uh, something I held on to because I thought that's an interesting story. It was an 81-year-old widow. She had less than a dozen friends. She only had one uh, distant relative, a second cousin. So when she died, she failed to make out a will. And it's interesting to find out, this happened around 1930, uh, November 16th, 1930, she had died. And what was interesting, she left behind a $17 million state. So what's crazy is you had all kinds of people, 26,000 different persons claiming that they were the rightful heir to that estate. You had all kinds of people from 47 states, 29 foreign languages, represented by over 3,000 lawyers committing perjury, faking family records, even using forge, forgeries in family Bibles that they had made up, uh, tales of illegitimacy, uh, crazy. And there were suicides, murders, uh, several jail sentences as a result of this. And that just shows you how corrupt the human heart is, you know. 
And that one minuscule situation, which was momentous in those days, that's relived every day in different ways in our society. And there's all kinds of corruption because of covetousness. And it's heartbreaking indeed. Now, uh, as I said, I was going to go through a lot of those people who actually won lotteries. And actually, I've looked at some of their lives and it's like, ah. Now, I'm not saying somebody can't win the lottery. And God bless you. It'd be great, you know, be very responsible with their money. But if it's covetousness that was at the root of that, you know, and that was their lifestyle, you know, uh, then they're just going to blow it down the road because they're not going to be satisfied. You know, it's easier to be content with less money than a lot of money. Tell me, who's more content? A man with seven kids or a man with seven million dollars? If you have seven million dollars, you're probably going to want more money. If you have seven kids, you're probably like, I have plenty, you know. You know, you may not be satisfied. Praise God, more power to you, you know, and your wife, you know. But praise God. So, but look what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And when you see what he says in verse 15, to me this was one of the most important declarations ever uttered on earth. Look what he says here. And he, all everything Jesus says is wonderful, obviously. But look what he says in John chapter, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard. Now there's two different Greek words he uses. Beware and on your guard is another Greek word actually from a Greek word, New Testament being written in Greek. Beware. You know, be alert and be on your guard, man. Have your dukes up. Against what? I mean, like you're, 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 you're protecting yourself. You're supposed to be beware. And be on your guard against every form of greed. Against every form of greed or covetousness. You have to beware. You have to be on your guard. And the moment you think, well, I have no problem in this life, I'll never will, you've got to be careful. Because, you know, it may not be one of the weaknesses that you have in your life, but then the enemy could exploit it later in your life. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Now check out what he says. This is what is so profound. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And that's so important. That's the, one of the biggest lessons we could learn in this country that we live in because one's person is often measured by their possessions in the United States of America. One's worth is measured by their wealth. And that's not the way it is, you know. Uh, you know, in God's eyes, God sees you as either saved or lost, as either serving Him or not serving Him. And Jesus said, our stature, or who we are, does not consist in what we have, what we own. God doesn't look and say, well, that person has this many houses and these many cars and this much land and this, much, this many assets and this many stocks, and wow, the stocks are doing good. He's uh, worth a lot. And this guy has very little. He's not worth much. No, in fact, it's quite interesting because uh, when you look at this, Jesus says, I have come. He says, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have what? Life and life more abundantly. And the Bible says that that life is in the Son. It's in Christ. That's those who are truly rich. Now, look at the very next verse. And now he illustrates this. He illustrates why you need to be in guard, why you need to beware, and why you need to be on guard against every form, every form of greed. You might say, oh, you know, I'm not into possessions, you know. I'm not, I'm not materialistic at all, you know. I'm not greedy like that. But then you have a problem of sexual sin. That's another form of greed. You're trying to covet another man's wife or something sexually, whether it's through pornography or whatever. And that's another form of greed. Or maybe it's, you know, it's totally different. Maybe it's drugs. You're coveting drugs, so you have certain feelings and trying to fill the void that way. It's all peanut butter, man, for a thirsty soul. And Jesus says he alone gives the water of life. And it's a deception. You'll never have joy. You know, you'll never have joy. It's a lie. You know? How many millions of Christians can testify to that, that before they were saved, that they, were, they lived for possessions, they lived for sex, they lived for drugs, they lived for alcohol, and it was a, a dead-end street, and they were spiritually bankrupt, and then they came to an end of themselves, and they woke up and saw why they were created, and they came to the Lord Jesus Christ, they got saved, they got washed in the blood of Christ, amen? Their feet were standing, standing on the rock now, and they're going forward, and their lives are filled with joy, and their families are blessed, and they're praising God. There's millions of testimonies to that. 
My life's a testimony of that, and many of your lives, everybody that's saved out there, your life's a testimony to that. Amen? So why go back to those things from which in the past we had no real benefit that we're ashamed of now? You know, those are lies. And it's interesting because when Jesus gives in this, uh, look what he says, it's very interesting how he, just, how he gives this parable in verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And you know what? I've been praying. I always pray, Lord, you know, please give me wisdom. Give me insight into the Scripture. And sometimes there's a lot of things there and we just read them too quickly. And, and this one didn't hit me till later, but I thought, isn't that interesting? The land of a rich man was very productive. There's a couple of things there that, are really, that really can jump out at you when you think them through. First of all, and, and you'd have to compare this with other Scriptures or be thinking of some other Scriptures maybe to get the sense of this. But it blows me away because he says the land of a rich man. And one translation says, King James, I think, a certain rich man, you know. And I, and I thought, that's interesting because what's always kind of hit me when I look at Lazarus. Remember what Jesus gave the illustration of Lazarus? That's in Luke 16. And the rich man. And the rich man, I mean, he was, you know, decked in, out in the best clothes and he had the best food and everything else. And he could care less about others, the poor, and Lazarus would just contend with the dogs that licked his sores, Lazarus's poor sores, for the same food. And they die, and the rich man, Jesus says, ends up in hell, in torment in the flame, crying to get out, but it's too late. And Lazarus is taken by one of the angels, or is taken by the angels to paradise, Abraham's bosom, where there's water. And, and, and the rich man sees him afar off, saying, Abraham, send Lazarus, have him dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue for him in torment in his flame. Abraham says, no, there's a gulf between us. It's too late. And what's interesting to me, and what's, one of the things that's interested me in that passage that stuck out is the rich man who would be on Who's Who, you know, and Who's Who or Forbes magazine in those days, right? His name's not even mentioned. He's just a rich man. But Lazarus, who wouldn't be in Who's Who, wouldn't be in Forbes, who most people are, and if anybody knew his name, God knew his name. And when Jesus gives parables, he typically doesn't, God bless you, he typically doesn't give names. And I love the fact that he gives Lazarus his name. Because Jesus says to his disciples, who are rejected by the world, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Okay? And that to me is huge. So when I read this passage and I see that, you know, the land of a rich man was very productive, it stands out to me still again. Because... In God's eyes, it's a rich man. It's not somebody like, wow, look at Bill Gates, man. Wow, look at Donald Trump. Let's bow down to them. God doesn't recognize someone according to the flesh, the Scriptures say. God gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. And my hope and prayer is that Bill Gates will bow before the Lord, you know, and he'll use his money to get the gospel out so people will know the truth. You know, so it's interesting because as I've looked at this, it's funny. I, I checked out a little bit about Bill Gates, his assets. Since March 13th, 1986, Bill Gates has been making money at a compounded interest rate of 35% per year. If this rate continues, uh, he will become a trillionaire on January 16th, 2014. The U.S. national debt, uh, as of just a few years ago, was 6.27 trillion at the current rate of growth bill gate could pay off the national debt at 2020 he could pay off our entire national debt that's pretty crazy in fact he could give uh right now he could give each person on earth you know five six bucks that guy's got some money right so and in fact if you lined up bill gates's money dollar to dollar one end to the other you can go back and forth from the moon like six or seven times Okay, the guy's got some money, and he's in the who's who. He's in Forbes and so forth. But the sad thing is, is if he's living for that money, and he doesn't turn to the Lord, he's in dire straits. He's going down the creek without a paddle, because in the end, it's God who holds our futures. Amen? And this is important. So now let's go back to the text. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he says... 
And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns. And that kind of blows me away too. Because he says barns, plural. He's already rich. He's, I mean, in those days, most people didn't even have a barn. He's got barns. I will, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Now, it's interesting because I want you to think of the successfulness of this guy's life. He's successful. He already, before he has this bumper crop come in, before his stocks go through the roof, he's already got barns filled with things. So he has a successful life in the world's eyes. However, his name isn't mentioned. We just know there's a rich man. Lazarus' his name, who was poor, who had to contend for food with dogs and had sores that were licked by those same dogs. When he died, he was carried in to paradise. That's huge to me. Because who really had the successful life? If Lazarus was crying out to God for help, and the rich man, it was harder to get him, him into the kingdom than a camel through the eye of a needle, as Jesus said, because he depended on his riches for salvation and didn't look to the Lord. Who has the most when he dies rich man can't take it with him so i want to look at the successfulness of his life but i also want you to consider the selfishness of his life notice what he says i want you to look at the selfishness of his life notice in verse 17 and it's interesting because you see this like 11 times it's about 11 times you see you know this personal pronoun that he uses over and over again of himself verse 17 and he began reasoning to who himself not to god he didn't begin seeking the lord say wow lord he didn't say thank you once to the lord the bible says to give thanks in all things that could be hard to do sometimes when you're going through something really rough but you think you could at least be thankful man when you get the biggest crop of your life but notice it's just, he, he seems successful outwardly, and he is in the material world. But he's also, I want you to look at the selfishness of his life, because it says, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? You catch that? I, 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 my, my, my. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And, verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Which I think is interesting in itself. I pointed that out before. Because last time I just alluded to this passage, we didn't actually look at it and study it. But this guy hasn't even enjoyed his life. You know? He's finally, he's got these barns, he's got a lot of things, but he hasn't even enjoyed what God's allowed him to have, hasn't been thankful. And just now he's saying, I'm going to enjoy these things. But right when he's going to finally enjoy these things, he's going to die. And that's something that we need to look at as well. But what's interesting here is it's all about his life and what he's done. Remember an old, old, old movie? Remember uh, Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart? Anybody see that? You know, that's, it's still at Blockbuster. It's hard to find good movies. And I rented that like, weeks back and jimmy stewart he's sitting at the table and he's like and he's wealthy you know landowner you know and he's fighting for his land and there's a war going on you know and uh a civil war and he doesn't want his family involved he's got all his land and when he prays he prays much like this guy thank you god but he mentions god but he says thank you god for the crops that of the seeds that we planted on the land that we plowed and they emphasize that on purpose he's very like not he doesn't like he, and he goes to church and he's just you know sour you know like like you know wet blankets been thrown up him where he's eating a lemon you know and until the end of the movie you know then he starts to become thankful he shows him in church at the end and then he begins to start to sing finally and be thankful you know but it's interesting now you wonder if they got some of that concept of him selfishness because this guy is saying look what i've done and you could get like that if you forget where it all comes from because think about this for a minute. Go up to verse 16. Remember I said there's a couple things that are actually pretty powerful there? 
And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. Notice he doesn't say by the sweat, blood, sweat, and tears and all the effort of a rich man he brought forth. Do you catch that? Look what it says. The land of a rich man was very productive. Who is the one that provides productive land? The Lord. Who's the one that provides the seeds? Who's the one that provides the rainfall to cause the seeds to germinate? Who's the one that provides the oxen to plow the fields? Who's the one that provides the sunlight and the photosynthesis and the growth and the fruit and the corn or the wheat? It's all the Lord. We just go dig it up, plant the seeds and watch it work. We got the easy part compared to what the Lord has done. And that's why I love verse 16, the land of a rich man. See, our perspective is, look what I've done. God's perspective is, look what my land has given you. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the Scriptures say. And we have to make sure, and I emphasize that because it's so easy to look from a human perspective because we're selfish by nature and not see God's perspective and not be thankful for all that He's provided for us. Amen? And once we start to be more thankful, I believe we'll be less covetous as well because we'll realize it's come from the Lord. You know? When you eat, you should be thankful. You say, wow, Lord, I thank you for this hamburger that I cooked on the grill, that I turned over with a spatula with my big bicep, okay, that the Lord gave you, you know. The, that's a cow the Lord made. I mean, you don't see the whole process. You just think that you did something, and, you know, not that anybody would boast in making a hamburger, but I'm sure it's happened <laughs> in the past somewhere. Make some good sandwiches. Wow, look what I've done. You know? I'm the killer sandwich maker, man. Anyway, you can, we're seeing the, we're seeing the, uh, the, really there's a sadness of his life too. I see, I see not only personally the uh, successfulness of his life from a worldly perspective, the selfishness of his life, but also I see the sadness of his life. This guy's sad. He's alone, isn't he? And that's what blows me away about rich people that live for wealth is that they're really sad because they're alone and we weren't created to be alone. And what happens with riches so often is people isolate themselves because sometimes they have to hold other people uh, in contempt or uh, they, they become weary because there's a lot of other covetous people around them at times. And, uh, or they, they're busy hoarding and it's about me, myself, and I. We live in the, the me, me, me generation today a materialistic generation for sure. Even the New Agers who claim to be spiritual, uh, you know, are all talking about the secret and how we can be healthy and wealthy and all that now today, you know. And that's how a lot of professing Christians have been with a lot of the false Christianity that's emphasizing how God wants everybody rich. And there's a lot of lonely people out there who are being jaded because they are trying to fill a void that thirst with peanut butter, you know, or salt water. You know, you keep drinking salt water, you're just going to get thirstier and thirstier. You need fresh water. We need the living water. Amen. We need the Lord Jesus. So we need to keep in mind, the scriptures say in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Now I like, I like this because it says, Behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens, the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that is therein. Psalm 24, 1 says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Everything you see belongs to God. Okay. Everything around us, God created. Haggai 2.8 says, uh, the sil God says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. It's not our money. It's His money. It belongs to Him. And we need to keep our eyes and our mind on that. 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 20 says that even our bodies are not our own. Amen? We were created by God as image and it says that we've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies. James 1 7 says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. It says it comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And it says in him there's no shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He's always good. Everything we have, every good thing we have, we've been blessed with from the Lord. However, we can forget that. Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18, it says, Do not say in your heart, my power and my might and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. That's exactly what this guy is doing. Did you notice that? 
The Lord warns about that because He's going to bring them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. A land flowing with milk and honey. He's just going to bless them with houses that they didn't even build. And He warns them, when you go into the land, don't go into the land and say, my heart, you know, has uh, in my hand, my power, my might, and my hand has gotten me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Whatever you have today is because God has made it possible, brothers and sisters. Isn't that true? He's the one that's giving you the ability to get whatever you have. And by the way, I've told you before, everybody here, everybody here, for the most part, if you have clothes on your back, if you have a place to stay, you're wealthier than most people on the planet. And we so forget that. And we always look at the Joneses down the street. God forbid, don't do that. Don't do that. Be thankful for what the Lord has done. Amen? Now, it's interesting because we're seeing the successfulness of his life, the selfishness of his life, and the sadness of his life. But there's some other things that we need to look at as well. And this guy's not praying, you know, to the Lord. He's praying to himself. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my riches I can keep. I pray my stocks are on the rise and, then my, and that my analyst is wise. If I grow broke before I wake, I pray my Mercedes they won't take. You know? That's how this guy prays. It's all about what he has and what, about, what he can keep. But also what he doesn't recognize is the shortness of his life. The shortness of his life. You know? His life is short. Our lives are short. And that's what Jesus emphasizes here. In fact, uh, let's look at a couple more verses as we continue to read about this man. Go ahead and look at uh, verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. You fool. Now, he's in Forbes. And of that day, if there was a Forbes, this guy would be in it, man. So what, what, what people would look at him, they'd say, mm, guy in Forbes. God says, you Fool, not, I saw you in Forbes. He says, you fool. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Now, isn't this interesting? Look at verse 19, because there's something that Jesus purposely, I believe, contrasts here for us. Verse 19, he says, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Did you catch that? Many goods for many what? many years he's going to lose all of his goods and he doesn't have many years he doesn't have many months or days or minutes Isn't that crazy and i'll say to my soul soul you have many goods laid up for many years to come take your ease eat drink and be merry and the crazy thing is he's losing his many goods he doesn't have many years and to eat drink and be merry is going to be torment like the rich man in Luke 16, where he's tormented in the fire. There's no ease. There's torment because he's been separated from God who he's rejected. And God said, okay, you don't want to be with me in my kingdom? You go to the place where all my goodness, it's devoid of all my goodness. There's no love. There's no joy. There's no sunlight. There's no water. There's no, none of the things that you didn't appreciate from me on earth. None of those things are there. And you pay the consequence of your sin. There's judgment. There's punishment because you, you get judged according to your deeds. It's called justice. And this is heartbreaking because this guy has a plan, but he's left God out of his plans. As I said, you can see the eyes and the mys, there's like 11 of them there. In fact, the Bible says, the, to do the very opposite, it says, the Bible says, lean not on your own understanding, amen? Amen? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, amen? And then he will make your paths straight in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. Okay? We're not supposed to lean on understanding. So let's trust the Lord with all of our hearts and He'll make our paths. Can you imagine the difference if this guy would have just bowed down and said, God, thank you. You know, I haven't been thankful this time, but thank you for providing these blessings. You're so good. I want to live for your glory. I want to, I want to be a blessing back to you. The story would not end this way, folks. Okay? And your story ends personally on how you relate to God with who you are and how he's blessed you. Each, each person here has a story. Where, was this, where does this guy end up? He ends up in hell. The shortness of his life. He ends up in hell. Where are you going to be? You're going to be somewhere, somewhere in 500 years. In 100 years, you're going to be somewhere else other than this earth. It's in heaven or hell. Where are you going to be? It's based on decisions you make here. 
It's based on the gospel and whether you trust Jesus or not. And that's why, you know, that's why Sunday morning is so important. Amen? That's why being involved in fellowship and being in the Word is so important. Not only the Lord's Day, but every day. Lord, what's your will? Do the math. Be wise. I mean, look at this. This, this to me is very, very powerful. I had this passage in my notes last week to go through verse by verse a bit, but I didn't get to it. And I thought I was going to uh, maybe save it for another time or what have you. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to, I want to focus on that because this is so important, you guys. This is so important. And, and I love it when I can go to the, get to the teachings of Jesus, being the Old Testament, and then uh, see what Jesus said on the same, same subjects. Now, it's interesting because James chapter 4, verse 14, James says our life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And we know that. But, and I, I've said, I had a sister one time come up to me and say, how, you're always reminding us of how short our lives are. But I didn't know if she was encouraging me, saying that's good, or saying that bums me out, you know? And then she was, I don't know, she was around 30. She's in her 70s now, and no, I was kidding, you know? But, uh, and I thought, she didn't, I was kind of interested. I couldn't read her on that, you know? Nice gal, you know? Good, you know, friendship. But I was like, huh. Yeah, I'm going to keep doing it too, you know, because I want to make sure our house in order. The Bible says, the psalmist says, Lord, teach me to number my days. So I'll be ready to give an account when I go to see you. You're wise if you do that. But the Bible says the wicked, their days are cut short. They don't realize that they're going to boom, face God, and it's too late. And we want to be ready, amen? The Bible says that prepare, the Bible says, to meet your maker. So it says, are you prepared to meet your maker? Because any one of us could die today. In fact, there's a lot of people who will die when they don't expect. Since we've been working on a, uh, our video expose on Kinsey, the Kinsey syndrome, uh, some of the research we've turned up, do you know there's an a, 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 uh, incredible amount of people that die during the act of adultery? Did you know that? That's an interesting statistic. The amount of people that die while they're involved in adultery is higher than if they weren't involved in adultery while they're in the middle of the adultery. Not to get too graphic, but it's pretty amazing how many men have heart attacks at that time. Pretty crazy. Men, fear God. Women, takes two, fear God. Amen? So the shortness of his life. Life is short. Now, so, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5 says, Labor not to be rich. Don't strive to be rich. Cease from thy own wisdom. Will you set your eyes upon that which is not? This guy had his eyes on something that was gone. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Isn't that interesting? They're going to fly away. You can't take it with you. One comedian said, you can't take it with you. That's true, so I'm not going to die. But he's dead now. Okay, an old-time comedian. He's gone. And he had to face God. So God calls this man a fool. So the shortness of our lives is something that I think is important to remember. Now, the stupidity of his life. We need to talk about the stupidity of his life. This guy made some... I mean, he would be considered an incredible businessman of his day. But really, God's commentary is more about the stupidity of his life. Because look what the Lord goes on to say. Verse 20, But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? In other words, guess what? Everything he saved up is gone. Wasn't really a good business move, was it? It's gone. Doesn't have anything to show for it. And then his future, even worse, his future is without God. That's crazy. It's not only about what he's built up in the past, it's what he doesn't have in the future forever now. That wasn't very smart. The stupidity of his life is interesting here because when he says your soul is required of you, the Bible says in Proverbs 18 11, it says the rich man thinks of his wealth as an impregnable defense, a high wall of safety. What a dreamer in Proverbs 18 11. You're just dreaming if you think, man, that your wealth is going to somehow save you and there's a lot of wealthy people who invest in having their bodies frozen and things like that you know but hey the death rate mortality rate is very impressive one for one isn't that right now it's interesting uh 
the term required. Your soul is required of you. It, that is actually a fascinating term because it's a banking term that was used in those days of that which was on loan that was now to be paid back. That's why we're talking about the stupidity of his life. Because when Jesus uses the Greek word required, now your soul is required of you, he uses a banking term saying this man did, did not assess the fact that he was created by God and that he belonged to God and that his life should be used to serve God and that he would give an account and go before God to be sentenced with the stewardship that he was to have before God regarding how he lived his life. Our souls are, our souls are on loan. And there's one day that we will be required. That's, a, that's an accounting term. I think that's pretty interesting. And that we're going to stand before God. And this man had just failure and folly in his life and, and stupidity. And I, and I use strong words because this is, this is a strong destiny. Okay? We need to recognize that. And our lives are alone before God. Our lives are very short. Live them for the Lord. Be wise. And you know what? I think when we sit through the services and we get in the Word and Jesus' words are just so powerful and they ring so true and we know in our hearts and it's all good, but it's what happens when we leave here. You know, how do we live our lives? How are we investing our time, our talent, and our treasure into our own paradise which is going to vanish or into God's kingdom? You know, there's all kinds of things we could be doing for the Lord. Amen? And we're not talking about that you can't enjoy how the Lord's blessed you. Paul says, you know, Paul mentions in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that God gives us all things to enjoy. He says, however, use your, your money to be a blessing to others. And don't put your trust in the uncertainty of riches. And he says that uh, use it for God's glory. He says you enjoy it. You can enjoy what God's given you. He didn't give you everything. You know, he didn't bless you and say, but I don't, he's giving you 3,000 taste buds on your tongue. Okay, he wants you to enjoy, but you can, it's very easy to overindulge. Isn't that true? So what we want to do is make sure that we not only enjoy what he's given us. This guy didn't enjoy or employ. You want to enjoy and say, thank you, Lord, and give him thanks. But you also want to employ what he's given you, the resources for his kingdom. Enjoy and employ. Amen? And it's hard to have a correct balance in that. But say, Lord, help me to not overenjoy to where I'm not employing and help me to think of employing first. Amen? Then enjoying. That's the best way to get the balance. Make sure, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16 that on the first day of the week as believers, we should lay up for God. You know, uh, give unto the Lord. You know, that's why the first day of the week, that's why we do have an offering. That's taught in 1 Corinthians 16 that we're supposed to lay aside for the first day of the week, Sunday, Lord's Day. It's when they met in the early church, when you read the early church fathers, you know, and you're supposed to give unto the Lord. So we live for the kingdom. We live to be a blessing to others. So we don't have the stupidity of our lives where we live for ourselves. I, 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 my, 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 my. Then we face God and it's too late. We live for the Lord. Amen. Now, what about the sentencing of his soul? The sentencing of his soul. He says, now your soul you know, he says, but God said to him, but you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have had prepared? Not him. And it didn't go ahead. I mean, Jesus said, lay not for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust do corrupt and thieves break and steal, but, but lay it up in heaven. He doesn't have anything laid up. Everything he's prepared is on earth. And it's gone. So his soul is barren. He has nothing. You know, and you want to read what happens to the rich man who isn't right with God. That's Luke 16. That's the guy that ends up in, in hell, in torment. Wish he could just get a drop of water. Before he had everything, but now he can't even get a drop of water. He's in torment. But Lazarus, who had nothing, Jesus said, is now comforted in paradise. The solution for his life. What's the solution for his life? Look at verse 21. Verse 21. So is the man who stores treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So is the man. The man like this. The man that is not rich toward God but stores up treasure for himself on earth. It's all about him. He's going to be like this man right here. He's going to hear the same thing. God's going to call him a fool. 
That's what Jesus says. Just like this rich man here, God's going to call those who live for themselves on judgment day, fool. You fool. That's what God's going to say. That's heavy, man. And so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The solution for his life would have been to be rich toward God. He can't change it now that he's died. But we can change it if we're living for ourselves. We need to be rich toward God. Amen? We want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. We're sorry we couldn't bring it to you in its entirety, but you can hear it online in its full content. Uh, our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. Till next time.